At the end of the day, Dune is a psychedelic journey. I thought that uh, visually, uh, that the, to make the movie look as familiar as possible for the audience, trying to go away from exotism, trying to find images that would be strong, but that will feel strangely familiar, a link with uh, our own relationship with nature, but the way to bring more, uh, some kind of more uh, psychedelism, if such a word exists in English, <laughs> is with sound and with Hans Zimmer. Getting a call from Denis is, I think, akin to an actor getting that call there that they got the role. You know, it's that thrilling moment where you know you're about to have a great adventure. While you're working with Denis Villeneuve, you're pinching yourself saying, is this really happening? Are we really experiencing this? Because you are experiencing filmmaking in a way that you don't experience anywhere else. So when you get the call from Denis, and, uh, and on Dune, I got it in the form of an email, very simple. Hey, Mark, we're going to make Dune. I want to get the band back together again. And I was like, yes, it's going to be that same little group, creative group of Joe Walker, Theo Green, Ron Bartlett, Doug Hempel, and myself. And I, I, I just couldn't have been happier because I knew we were going to go through this, this process of again of building a movie together, building a soundtrack together, and doing it in very non-traditional ways. We use very much the same method as we did on Blade Runner 2049. Me starting as they were shooting in the studio in Budapest, so that Joe Walker, the editor, could start integrating the sort of sounds that he could never find in a library and use those to accompany scenes of the worm, of the ornithopters, um, the shields, and the voice. Dinny always wanted to find a way that we could collaborate all parts of post-production that normally would not be involved in a shoot but he brought us all out to Budapest so that we were able to feed our ideas together. So that's the sort of thing that Denis always encouraged. He did on Blade Runner, and uh, it worked so well that, of course, he wanted to do it again for Dune. I mean, the key is Denis, really. I mean, obviously, he's uh, the top of his game. He's one of the best directors out there, and I just love working with him, and I want to bring my A game every day for this guy. I would do anything, because and Mark and Theo, everyone will tell you the same thing, that this group of people is so musical and we all speak the same kind of language with that. We've all known each other for years, but Denis expects you to bring your A-game. There's no joke about that, you know? It's like, he wants you to bring it. It's like, show me what you got. What better place to do that than on this movie with these people? And uh, that's what's so much fun. When I was uh, working in uh, smaller budget movies, it's something that I, I was very, very frustrated by. You wrote a screenplay for years, you shoot, you take your time, you have time to edit the movie, and right at the end, you rush to do the sound. And then I remember my first movies, all of them have moments that I, I, I didn't have the time to think enough, to digest enough, to work, uh, to, to make sure that the, the sound had deep enough roots to make sure that the ideas will hold the test of time like the rest of the film process, where I feel I was feeling comfortable with everything but the sound. And, and I knew that the answer to that was, was to bring the sound right after the screenwriting and, and to start to work on the sound as we were shooting. And it's just to have space to explore, to experiment and to make mistakes, which is uh, crucial to find new ways of doing things. You have to, to take risks. It means that uh, the sound that you are hearing in Dune are old sound to me, sound that I got used to it, rejecting them, bringing them back, uh, modifying, uh, trying things. They have been tested multiple times and, and now I'm very comfortable with them and I know they are the right ones. But for that, it takes time to experiment. The way we, we approach the sound in the movie, there was this idea of having a contrast where instead of trying to make a sci-fi movie, we were trying to make a documentary. <laughs> I mean, it's like we had brought the documentary team into the world of Arrakis that, uh, with a boom guy that will try to capture the sound there. And it's just this idea of having a feeling of being immersed and uh, not trying to impress the audience, but f more, more to feel that they are there. So that, that was a bit the, the main spirit of the sound design. When I first got the script, I decided to go and stay in a hotel in Death Valley, where there was a nearby sand dune called Mesquite Sand. So 
not only did I get something of the atmosphere of Dune, but also I wanted to know what it sounded like to stand in silence on a sand dune. I wanted to know what that sand sounds like when you're climbing up a deep, powdery mountain of sand. And I wanted to experiment with the sounds of sand dunes that I'd heard. Our re-recording mixer, Doug Hemphill, had recorded these incredible sounds of what he called singing sand dunes. Um, this is something, you know, you can find clips on YouTube, and we did plenty of research and realized that this is a audio phenomenon that not many people know about, that sand dunes make a, a sound of their own. It's a singing or a groaning, however you want to describe it. To make that sound, they must be resonant, like a musical instrument. So I wanted to plant microphones under the ground. I wanted to run on the sand. All of the things that I was reading in the script, I wanted to know both the human things and potentially something unhuman like the worm, what that's going to sound like. And experimenting with sand was a huge part of it. That's one of the few things on planet Arrakis that we can have an equivalent for on Earth. We can go and do the research. The trope in cinema sound is that, oddly, in the desert, we often hear wind, and I think that's an uninspired and unthoughtful choice um, in sound because, in fact, until late in the day in the desert, there is no wind, and, and yet that's somehow been a, an established trope to say hot or warm or something to that effect. And we spent a couple of days in Death Valley burying microphones to capture thumper sounds and things like that. But we also did a number of really kind of cool furrowing sounds. We, we would take microphones and kind of jam them through the sand and as if mimicking the, the worm's motions. And then we would, knowing we would bring those sounds back into the studio and process them to make them bigger and more worm-like. The presence of the worm, when you hear it coming from a distance, is described in the books and in the script as worm sign. Denis had always described that to myself and Mark Mangini as almost like an insect fluttering its wings. Something so small at first that you wouldn't know that there's a huge beast coming. Our early experiments with the worm were sadly a little too traditional. We didn't quite understand that the worm wanted to be seen as a creature of, of reverence. And we were building Godzilla. And in our early experiments with the worm, um, we didn't get that Denis did not want to frighten the audience with the worm. We wanted the audience to be in awe of the worm. So we did experiment a little bit and it was quite early on that we realized that if the worm travels through sand, it must be vibrating. That's the only thing that would liquefy the sand enough for it to be able to make a path through underneath. So we tried various ways of vibrating sand, and that's one of the things that we did in the desert. We recorded sand fast vibrations, and we also had wonderful visuals to work with that Denny had shot with Greg Fraser, the cinematographer. So that idea of worm sign and a fluttering sand becomes like a signature for a distant worm. It's making the, the whole desert shake. I asked uh, Mark and Theo to develop a sound that would be in total contrast with the bees, something that would be kind of a, you don't know if it's an in insect or a bird or something small that at the beginning that will announce the approach of the, the worm, like a, a strange little sound that uh, the native will definitely uh, recognize, but that uh, Someone that is in the desert will think it's a small animal or something that's just like something delicate to, to as a warning that it would be a beautiful contrast. And once the, the worm is outside, it's, I didn't want it to sound like a monster. I wanted it to, to, it to, to be like a godlike entity, something that is very, that feel a very strong presence, like a s strange intelligence. But I didn't want to look monstery. I wanted it to be like uh, when you meet a worm. It's almost a spiritual experience. One of the notes that Denis had given me is, this is the driest thing on the driest planet. This is not a gurgling monster. We don't want gross sounds. 
But more importantly than that, it's not meant to be a monster that scares you necessarily. In fact, this is a godlike creature. You could say that it's the god of the planet Arrakis. One idea that came later on was what we call the gunk gunk, which is this sound you occasionally hear coming from deep within uh, a sandworm. And it sounds very much like the sand thumpers which the Fremen used to attract the worms. So there's this idea that perhaps in the same way that whales call to each other, sandworms have a way of communicating, but it's this deep thumping sound, and that's why they respond to the thumpers. Once we had established that sound, we realized, Denis realized, I gotta get this to VFX, and he animated, I don't know if you remember in the shot, you could see the epiglottis or whatever that deep in the maw, that was animated to us. So sound drove what we did visually, and that was very gratifying. The desert is uh, at the very heart of the, of the movie, of course, and it, it, the desert brings with it this uh, sound quality that where you are, like, um, as much visually, you have uh, infinity in front of you. The silence and uh, the weight of, uh, of the heat and thing brings sound very, very close to you. It becomes like a very introspective experience. And the only thing that you can hear sometimes is your breathing and, and, and your heart beat. And there's so many elements in the book, so many details, so many, uh, and and uh, it, we could have easily crushed the audience with exposition. And instead, we tried to uh, to use uh, uh, cinematic devices to in order to explain or to have, feel that the audience will feel will recognize, will feel more and more familiar with some aspect of the movie. One of them is the spice, and sound was definitely a way to give it its uh, personality and something that. Uh, People who are not familiar with the book will recognize that the spice to feel special. And uh, uh, that's why we, we brought that kind of very ethereal, very delicate. The Dune soundscape is really about contrast. It's all a, Dune is all about extreme, and we try to do the same with the sound. So you have that very, very delicate sound in the vastness of that big silence here. It's quite a moment in the film where there, it's like a rescue, basically, because the the worm is coming, he's gonna take over the crawler and all that. But that's the first time Paul really experiences it. He takes off his mask and he yeah, he gets nailed by this. It's like a acid trip almost. So feeling the sense of the particles is one, to where it's that kind of light glistening kind of feel, but it's also taking away stuff. Okay, we built this whole thing up and then this big wave of sand comes across which has the spice in it that's going to overtake him and it's a big frequency roll off that Doug did as a great trick. He goes like that and it just we just sucked everything out. So it's like really pulling the rug out of it. And then I took all of the more ethereal uh, musical elements and, and spin them around the room and then uh, in comes all these Benny Gesserit voices and layers of that that are, I put all sorts of delays and, and the delays are spinning and, and it's just to make him feel like, you know, if you're overwhelmed by something like that, you're going to be disoriented. It's one of my favorite sequences in the movie. There are many aspects to the spiritual world in Dune. There are the, there's the internal world of Paul, especially when he's experiencing visions and spice. And then when I saw the film and how uh, central those visions are um, and how it really depicts the spiritual world of Paul and the Bene Gesserits, I started recording a lot of voices in the head. I mean, ultimately this is a story of a person who is told that he is gonna be the Messiah and who hears voices in his head. Um, this is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> and so I wanted to 
create a, a world inside Paul's head. There were multiple uh, ideas on the table, you know. Uh, it was a very exciting thing to design, but the, for me, the most important thing is that there was this, this idea that uh, as you're doing the voice, you will channel old identities coming from your past, from the uh, being a Bene Gesserit. It means that you are like in contact with uh, your uh, ancestors, that uh, you can channel those. Uh, and and uh, I'm always obsessed by this idea that uh, we are struggling as human beings with uh, genetic or uh, our genetics or our education, but very about the genetic, there's something about struggling with the voices from the past. I'm not talking about schizophrenia, I'm talking about subconscious influence, you know, how come that we have pulsions or impulse to do things sometimes that feels totally illogic, but are strong uh, uh, influence on, on the, the way you take your decisions or you, you direct your life. And this idea that uh, someone using the voice will channel power from the past and will feminine power. And, and uh, I was obsessed with the idea of very powerful old voice. And what's incredible about that is that once we had the concept, we leveraged it in so many other ways that we never knew we were going to be able to do. So once he signed off on the idea that, oh, you mean Paul could speak with someone else's voice? It could be this deep, authoritative woman speaking instead of Paul, either as him or with him or not with him. And the ideas just tumbled out of that basic concept that came from nowhere. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know where creative ideas came from, but it hit me and I had to tell him. That will not necessarily look like witches, but like very powerful, strong women from the past that will be your force inside you. It's something very personal to me. It deeply speaks to me. And, 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 and uh, so I tried, I asked my sound team to, 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 we did casting, we found those voices, and but that was like experimental. That was a laboratory. That was not done over a weekend to find the balance and also to play with the subs the way we um, play with the, with the power of the sound system is, is uh, to find that balance was a, it was a long process. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here, kneel. How dare you use the voice on me? Mark Mangini and I made a lot of recordings with different voice artists. Gene Gilpin and even Marianne Faithful was involved in recording. We wanted people with gritty voices that reminded us of, uh, let's say, an ancestor. It could be a Bene Gesserit ancestor. So as Paul's spirituality develops, he's learning to use a new technique um, that we call the voice. So the idea of what's going on inside Paul's mind is very important but also he's learning how to project that. And in projecting the voice, the resonance of a person's voice is increased, especially in the bass, to the point where the room rattles. Give me the water. So it was all about layering all of these elements, but it's so short when he says, you know, give me the water, for instance, it's a short phrase, and you have to convey all of that in this like second and a half. So it was uh, experimenting by moving it out of sync at first, and Paul's not very good at it yet, so his took a while to develop, and it didn't quite work all the way. She goes halfway with the water, whereas later when you hear the Reverend Mother do it, it's just bang on, and you're gonna get it because it's a weapon, and she's so good at it because she's developed it over centuries kind of feeling. Uh, so it's in sync, it's powerful, it's percussive, and hers ha still has layers, but it's just bang on, you know, it really nails you in the chest, so and then it draws him in like that, it's, it takes over everything. That's something which I learned a trick from Lee Scratch Perry, who I worked with in Switzerland about 10 years ago. Uh, he's the pioneer of dub reggae, which must be the genre of music with the most bass. And one of the tricks that he used was to record a bass line and then to play it back through a huge speaker in a room that's resonant and record that. 
so it enhances the resonance of the bass. You also hear something of the shaking of the room. So that was one of the tricks that we used to uh, give a sort of uh, a very tactile sense to this spiritual adventure that Paul's going on. Once we discovered what we could do with the voice, with Paul, we discovered other narrative possibilities. Now the ancient voice could speak subtext and text and tell story even when it's not being deployed as the voice. As you heard in many of those dream sequences, we had the ancient voice saying, you know, Paul, rise up, rise up. And all of a sudden it unlocked a storytelling tool for Denis that he just loved. And I'm really proud of how that came about and how we found that. But it did take a year and a half of development to really find it. There's a lot of ideas in Dune about the geopolitics, about the religions, about the, a lot of characters. And I wanted the, the design and the technology to be, to feel familiar to, to the audience. Something that you will recognize right away, you will believe right away, you will, you will not question. And uh, it will just, you will embrace it spontaneously and say, okay, that, that looks like an helicopter. Okay, let's listen to what those characters have to say now. It's, I didn't want it to be distracting. I, uh, more important, I wanted it to look as real as possible. We're good to go. There's nothing more powerful than an, an insect. I think that if a fly was uh, the size of a helicopter, it could uh, grab a, a truck. Or I don't know. It's, it's like those are very powerful beings. I decided to, to make them look like a dragonfly. I know that it's something that an idea that Brian Herbert loved too. That uh, so we bo both agree on that. And uh, I wanted it to look muscular, uh, military, something that was designed to go into very difficult environments. And then uh, Mark and Theo came with, I, I, I said to them, it, it, the sound of it needs to, it's just about things flapping in the air. It needs to feel like um, real. It will sound close to the spirit of an helicopter. It must not sound like an helicopter, but in the same family. And they came with those, uh, the exploration of the use real beetles and sound and uh, the familiarity. Uh, that was the goal, yeah. We can be more successful in our sound design when we start it with acoustic recordings. The reason for that, I think, and this is a hypothesis, I'm not a scientist, is that uh, subconsciously there are embedded elements of acoustic recordings that tell the brain this is real. And it's all about the time arrival to the ear and the acoustic environment that a sound lives within that synthesized or synthetic or electronic sounds don't inherently have. You, you can add them in post-production by adding reverbs and delays and things like that, but they're never as complex or as rich as the acoustics that you get in real life. So everything that we built the ornithopters out of started life as a real thing, as a real thing that could have done something. It's, you know, a wing in the, the uh, for the ornithopter started life as something that was kind of flapping up and down and and the, the motors were made out of things that were buzzing. And that, I think, allows the brain to quickly and subconsciously suspend disbelief because we're presenting you with a sound that's decontextualized from what it really is and presented in a new context. And the brain doesn't have to know what it was. It just knows, well, gosh, that sounds real to me. Well, that's one of the reasons it's organic and it's acoustic. So shields are very important in Dune because you might wonder why people don't have guns or some sort of space weapon in the future and why they're fighting with swords. Everyone in the Dune universe has a shield that can protect them against fast blows. So it's a universal technology. It's something that we really wanted to sound very different from force fields and other shields that we've heard in other movies. We didn't want it to be a, a constant hum or a drone. We only see it when it's really activated. So the initial idea that I developed was a sort of deep purring sound. It actually started as a filtered out machine gun. 
Denis liked the effect, but felt maybe it wasn't edgy, dangerous, weapon-like enough. And it wasn't until I had an accident with a synthesizer where it started to create a glitching and clicking. Come on, old man. When I first played that to Denis, he loved the idea. Um, we needed to craft a few details, like what it sounds like when the blade cuts through it. Maybe we show how that works when you're cutting through the shield, and we make it explicit with a red flashing um, from the shield in VFX and a beeping tone like an alarm. Denny was able to come up with extra functions that the shield would have. A VFX were able to hear the sound that we'd had, that we'd made, and make the, the visual effect of the shield pulsate in exactly the same rhythm as the clicking sound of the shield. So again, an idea that wasn't fully formed um, in VFX uh, when we started work on the sound. They were able to hear what we did. They were able to contribute new ideas. Denis was able to moderate those ideas and come up with new ones of his own. We never embark on these projects knowing what the final landing place is. I think if we did, we wouldn't be artists because then it's all canned and it's all premeditated. Um, that's the joy and the fear of being an artist is that you, you go in feet first saying, I'm gonna trust this and I'm gonna just see what comes out at the other side. And you can't be objective while you're doing it. So today I feel relief because I think it, it sounds good. <laughs> and we did achieve something really special. I, every film that I start, I wonder, why did I subject myself to this? This is terrifying. And then I get here today in front of you and I feel like, <sighs> wow, that was so good. D Dune is like uh, the story of a character that goes deeper, deeper into a, a landscape. And the deeper he goes, the, the deeper he goes into his own consciousness, getting closer and closer to a part of itself that was hidden, that reveals slowly to himself a part of his identity. So that inner journey is brought by the sound. And that was the first time I was working this way. And it was very exciting. It's like if the sound almost represents the subconscious of the character.